<laughs> Turn the volume up. What's up? We good? Sure. Yeah, we good. Let the team in. Let's get it going. The doors are open. Put the bat, bat signal out there. Very rare. Yeah, this is a very rare occasion. It's an honor and a privilege. Tap in with you guys anytime we get a chance to check in. We here early on a Thursday. Been recording content all day. Um, legendary situations as usual. Per usual. We gonna what's get up? This, what's up? We're gonna get this rocking. Ernest, what's going on? It's Thursday. Not a typical day for us, but this ain't a typical situation. This is a legendary situation. Let's see if the bro's here. Not yet. Yes. So greetings and salutations, good people. So this is a limited podcast, uh, four series. We're going to do four episodes with the good brother, John Henry and friends. And um, it's going to be a dope, deep dive into different topics every single week. And we will be breaking it down. Um, there will be PDFs available on site. I think John has the information on that when he comes on. Um, so, we, you know, we just wanted to just add as much value as possible. And um, we figured, you know, it would be a dope way to kind of just experiment with this type of situation that we really haven't done in the past. Um, and... Um, they make history like we always do. So, you know, I'm excited to be here and um, it's going to be legendary content. And uh, yeah, we ready, ready to get it rocking. Let me hit, let me hit the bro up. Yeah. Make sure he good. It's beautiful out here in New York. We are not complaining for the first time in a long time. And maybe for, for, make for sure, a while. Make sure you check the episode out right now with Boom. Grant Cardone. Shout out to Grant. That's a legendary situation. And uh, make sure at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, Ash Cash has PTG. He has a PTG boys on. Yeah. That's also on our YouTube channel. So, you know, we are. Um, right after this. We back to back to back, man. Like a real network. You watch CNBC, you watch CNN, and they got programming. 24 hours a day, they got programming. So that's how we treat EYL Network. Um, it's bigger than just, we started with just one show, but. Now we got a variety of shows that we offer. Yeah, yeah. Of shout, so things. shout out to everybody while you're speaking on a new show. Shout out to everybody that tapped in with uh, Casanova Brooks uh, yesterday, his debut episode. Um, if you haven't checked it out, go check it out. It was a really good one. I actually tapped in myself and then I, I watched a little bit. I previewed the Inside the Vault with PTG. The, uh, their energy is always crazy. Ash said he finally met his match. Yeah. I knew it. We knew it would go with it. Like, he, yeah, when he meets Dave, it's going to be a, 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 one of those moments. And so, that's a dope episode, everybody. Make sure y'all check that out as well. Yeah, for sure, man. So, and uh, make sure you check out Market Mondays, um, the latest episode that we got with our 19 Keys. That's legendary as well. Hey, remember that stock we was talking about on Monday? Oh, Microsoft. How'd that do? Microsoft is off, <laughs> off to, the, to the races right now. Um, Microsoft is off to the races right now. Uh, Apple has finally looked like, you yeah, know, today. it woke up out of his coma. Um, tech is back on. So, you know, stocks, all is well in the stock world. I told you, man, it's April, right? Remember that. Remember what we, what we said about April. And make sure that everybody that, uh, you know, you prepare yourself by putting your seatbelt on. The ups and downs are part of, part of the market. And so the more you learn and the more you're in it, you can stomach it a little bit better when there's downturn. So it's it's a patient game. Somebody, I said that earlier, right? Patience is, is the true sign of inner growth. And so once you know that these things are part of it and they don't bother you and you can't, you can sleep at night because you've done everything you, you could in your possible being to, to make a, you know, an intelligent decision, you can, you'll sleep easy. This is all part of it, y'all. Shout out to Andre Hatchett, who taught a dope class for EYL University yesterday. Yeah. That was legendary. And shout out to EYL University, man. It's um, really become a community 
and we have infinity groups inside of it. We have over 10 infinity groups. So we have stock market group. We have yeah. a real estate group. We have a cryptocurrency group. I believe there's an NFT group. And that's really more even valuable than anything else as far as the power of networking. You are the sum total of the five people that you spend the most time with. And a lot of times people say like, you know, I don't have a circle that is, talks about entrepreneurship. I don't have the friends that I need to grow. So, you know, part of not having it in your in your immediate circumference is finding it and a great place to find it is online. And it's dope to see that EYL University where people are actually building with each other, the Facebook page. So kudos to you guys, man. That's that's extremely, extremely value. You can't really even put a price tag yeah. on that, but that that part, the camaraderie and the lifting of each other um, is extremely, extremely important. Yeah, shout out to all the leaders. I know my man Duncan was in, is uh, heading up that uh, that stock group. Uh, so shout out to Duncan. Shout out to Angela. What's going on, Angie? Uh, thank you for everything you do. Uh, who else? We got Sabrina. She had the the party night the uh, other night. So shout out to all the leaders of the of these groups and these clubs, man. It it, it really is something to behold. And uh, we'll definitely be tapping in. I know I missed the uh, game night. I was upset about that, but I ain't gonna miss the next one. I will be there. So shout out to all of y'all for leading the way. Let's see you. Where's the bro? Where's the bro? And wait, of course, Janet. Of course, Janet. Of course, Janet. I spoke to Janet last night. J H. You say the name J H. Okay. So yeah, let's let's get this going. Just type in J H. John Henry actually type in his full name. There right he goes. There. There you go. All right, let's get this. Let's get this show on the road. Check, 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 check. Levels, levels. What's going on? What's up, family? What's up, family? What's up, family? We made it. Sorry, I'm a few minutes behind. How we living? Oh, we doing great, we John. Good. We How good, you, man? man? I'm good, man. Welcome, everyone, to the very first episode of The Wealth Principles, an exclusive digital experience. Had to give it up to my brothers on EYL for, for, uh, for nurturing the platform that is now synonymous for urban business culture salute <laughs> i appreciate it we're doing great man we're doing great appreciate it appreciate it i get that energy up shoddy let's go <laughs> <laughs> we living well man we uh oh you know we always working john you know that we just shot a legendary episode can't wait to put that out on the streets but uh we right here man this this is a very rare event obviously thursdays is kind of not a night that people use, are used to hearing from us. So I'm glad that everybody's tapped in right now. And I told him this, this is a legendary situation. Anytime we get to link with you and um, your, your mind frame and get to share your expertise, it's always going to be a treat. And so everybody's in for one who's tapped in right now. Yeah. 100%, man. Um, so yeah, so what we wanted to do with this is um, we coll we're collaborating with John for four, a four part series um, every Thursday at six o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And we're gonna be doing a deep dive kind of masterclass, whatever you wanna call it, on a different topic. And we're gonna bring guests in, and then we're gonna have some questions and answers. So today is the first one. And then also talk about the PDF situation, John. Yes, yes, 100%. So um, what we're doing is we will run through some exclusive material that we prepare specifically for the purposes of this conversation. We chose some topics that I feel like um, have been lightly tread treaded but haven't been thoroughly explored to the extent that i feel they could be should be um ought to be uh and so what we're going to do is make these available on um uh our website loopinsure.co slash eyl and make these available for download uh, i myself together with my team created these these are frameworks and visuals and concepts that we use on the daily here at loop um and it's you know, it's not insurance specific, it's company building specific. So in this particular one, um, yeah, man, I'm excited to get into it. Um, it's the power of brand. So brand is everything. Um, brand is everything. And the reason I wanted to kick it off with this particular topic is because of COVID, right? So, so what do I mean by that? Well, with offline now not available, um, you can't, you know, for a while we weren't able to shop in our favorite stores. We weren't able to hang out with friends. 
And so it pushed all consumers to a purely digital environment. And when that occurs, you effectively live in a brand dominated time in the marketplace. So what do I mean by that? We only, it, there's a reason the top five companies got two or three times bigger. And that's because we knew and trusted them already. So the companies, the players, the influencers, the artists, the musicians that invested in developing their brand infrastructure effectively got bigger. Um, and this is something that small business owners don't take as seriously as they should. This is something that uh, musicians don't take as seriously as they should. E-commerce, solopreneurs, single moms out there hustling with their side hustles. Brand really to everything that you are doing. Um, and I thought that we would create some kind of deep dive format to, to explore it in greater, in greater depth. All right, cool. Let's do it. So Let's do it. with that, let me pull up. Let me pull up a little ting ting here. One second. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, cool. So let me know, um, do I have screen share available? Yeah, I think I'll make you the, the co-host. So okay, 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 cool, screen. cool, cool, yeah. cool, cool. All right, bet. One sec, one sec. Who cool, man. So the power brain. Let's get into it a little bit. Um, we explore why and why you should care about brand. Um, but let's now talk about a little bit about what brand is. Brand, a lot of people will think, um, a lot of people think brand is a feeling or rather a lot of people think that brand is a, um, a logo a icon, typography, a color palette, you know, when you say, yo, let, you know, I want, I want a brand, you will go to, um, you will go to, you know, Cra Craigslist or whatever and get someone to make you a logo. But in reality, brand is a feeling. Brand is one core value that you have about your, um, your organization that is expressed in all of the things that you um in all of your in your color palette way in your icon and so on so when you look at it that way that's why a lot of you know let's explore some brands that are confused and let's explore some brands that are potent right so red bull in my opinion has one of the world's best brands and their core value that they wanted to lock in around was, um, I mean, just, just look at their commercials, right? It's people skydiving. It's, they barely talk about their drinks. Their brand really is that, cra <laughs> that crazy, uh, just that crazy feeling. And, and it's expressed in their tagline, Red Bull gives you wings. It's expressed in... Um, it's expressed in their colorway. It's expressed in the sports that they back. So they successfully locked in around a feeling. And that is really the key when you are working on your, your, uh, your side business or your small business or your main thing. You want to try and separate what it is that, um, what it is that you're doing. And you want to try and find that core, core feeling that you want to emit. And the, the reason why is because brand drives sales. So most people will lock in and try and sell you because you need sales to live. You need sales, sales generates oxygen. 
However, ultimately, brand, even though you get less ROI with brand up front, ultimately, brand gives you the long tail. It creates trust in the marketplace and people end up discovering you as a result of your brand versus selling someone as soon as they come in the door and, and effectively pushing them away through, through brand. Now we touched on brand drives trust, but let's touch a little bit on how you actually create a brand for yourself. This is an exercise that, that we use um, here at Loop. I've been using this for years. This exercise will take you hours, days, if not weeks. Um, and what you want to do effectively is get to right here, this purpose of why you exist. And I need hustles, for example, whom uh, will be joining us in a moment. Ani has a, a chai company, uh, like, a, like a tea shop concept, effectively. But what they stand for is, you know, they, they stand for representing Indian culture. And so he was able to tap into something deeper than what it is that he's selling. And as a result, carve tremendous brand equity. And that's how you get coverage from all the publications that he's getting coverage from. That's how you build a movement. And that's how customers are proud to support Kolkata, Chai Co, and so on. Um, and then that purpose informs the values. So the shit that you um, live out in your business every day, how you act on it, and then ultimately your tone of voice. So this is the actual framework that some of the top businesses in the world have used to create some of the best brands in the world. And to me, it's crazy that this little flat piece of paper, you know, it depends on how much you put into it. But if you put into it, you know, great thought and try to land on a deeper purpose for why you and your business exists, then you could potentially um, create the core ingredients that that creates a, a really compelling brand. Now, John, can, you, like, make, can, can you make the presentation um, larger to fit the screen? Yeah, let me try right now. I'm on Acrobat, so... If you can't, it's whatever, but... I hear you, I hear you. Um, I think this is as wide as it all gets. Right, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. Okay, okay, let me try and zoom in, maybe. No, no, it's all, it's, it's all right, it's all right. One sec, one second. All right, cool, 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 cool. Okay, cool, so... um. Yeah, I want to dive into the funnel real quick. Um, any transaction that has ever occurred, a customer goes through this specific funnel here from the top all the way down the bottom. Now, different people are different phases of the of their knowledge in your in your company effectively. So they could either come in already knowing that they want to buy from you, in which case they would go right through. But more commonly than not, I think something like only like 8% of the traffic that hits your site buys right away. The majority of people get stuck somewhere in the funnel. So this, I've been using this for years and years and years is how I think about every transaction effectively. Someone has to discover you up at the top here. They got to discover you. Now how, so that's awareness. Now how they discover you is up to you. Now you could, you can go and, and hustle it offline, like, like Nipsey selling, you know, albums at the back of at the trunk of his car. You could partner with influencers. You can get press. Press is cool. It gives you spikes in traffic, but ultimately you're at the mercy of other publications and what they think of your story. And you're at the mercy of whenever they choose to write about you. You can do paid ads, which is helpful because it's instant. However, the moment you turn that spend off, that traffic goes away. So in my opinion, this is kind of like the new school. The best way to fuel awareness is through organic content and podcasts. For example, no one knew EYL a couple of years ago 
and you guys locked in on the podcast and and now you have this awareness right now from there what do you do to get someone down from interest all the way down through to purchase my belief is that right here eventually someone will come through to your website you know they're they're going to poke around but ultimately they're going you know they're not going to pull the trigger until they feel that connection with you and who you are and what you do and so this is where brand comes into play brand is you nurture them through you know effectively content and other touch points to build that trust and so this customer this prospective customer is going to be here and they're just going to be going round and round being nurtured you can get them all down through to the rest of the funnel now just to touch on some quick some quick points here um these are just some industry terms you have the customer acquisition cost and the lifetime value these are the only two terms that you need to know to grow a big business and that's what does it cost you to bring in a customer and what's the lifetime value of that customer the lifetime value is the average amount that a customer makes you during the average period of time that they're with you. So for example, like Ani will have good insight around this for his business with insurance. You know, we might, we're projecting that people will renew three, four times. The average policy is a thousand dollars. So that's a customer, that's a lifetime value of three, $4,000. Your customer acquisition cost ideally is lower than the lifetime value which seems obvious, but people don't often have a super good understanding of what the ratio is. So let's dig into it a little bit. One to one, if it costs you a hundred bucks to get a customer and they make you a hundred bucks and you're breaking even. If it costs you a hundred and they make you 200, then this is considered solid. You know, three to one is excellent. Four to one you would think is actually great, but in reality, four to one means that you should be spending more money because if your ratios are that good, it means that you're not growing quickly enough, typically. So you wanna try and live in this two to three range here for, for, these, um, for the customer acquisition costs. And then ultimately this is what happens here. So people that over index on sales and make no mistake about it, almost everyone does. Everyone almost over indexes on sales and sales will get you that ROI immediately however over time it will dwindle in its effectiveness while brand typically costs you a ton of money up front you got to invest in content you got to invest in 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 design you got to invest in you got to put your time in and you're not going to see the long tail so most people will drop out and this bottom this bottom axis here that represents time as people, you know, are investing in brand, for example, the temptation of selling something right now that's cheap and quick, you know, sales, brand sales effectively dilutes brand. So it's a, it's a balance because you want to try and sell some shit right off the top and you should, you should find something to sell, but in a way, the longer you can hold out and effectively build brand value the more you'll be able to cash in more meaningfully down the stretch so, so can, I just, can i just jump in for a minute yeah yeah go ahead yeah that's that's just extremely i feel like i'm in college i am in college actually <laughs> you strangely i feel like i'm teaching this is my first <laughs> time like like teaching to it feels nah, strange but no nah, no nah, but that's real what you just said um as far as we talked about that before uh, a lot of people come on social media for their business and they get like two followers and they're like running 50% off ads and sales. And it's like, you don't even have an audience. And it's like, you know, the whole point of we're in business. So the whole point is to make money. We're never going to apologize about making money. If you are apologetic about making money, this isn't the channel for you, but right. there's ways to go about making money. And sometimes like if you promote too much or you're too gimmicky or you, you it's like you can make money, but over the course of time, you're diluting your brand yeah. because it's not. And even if we look at the best brands in the world, 
like Nike, like they have sale, but how many times do you actually see a Nike commercial selling something? Mm. It's not really too often. Most Nike commercials are like, you know, um, Andre Agassi, that legendary situation, or Michael Jordan with mm. dunking the basketball, yeah. Serena Williams with her daughter, like even Colin Kaepernick. It's a it's an ad to build their brand, not really selling anything because you're gonna buy it on the back end, mm-hmm. just by the strength of their brand just becoming so dominant that they don't necessarily have to beat you in the head with 50% off sales. You feel mm-hmm. compelled to buy it because they've built so much brand equity yeah. over the years. I think what you said is very important. John, I'm glad you broke that down with the awareness, interest and trust. It's like, if you have two followers, we don't even have an awareness of you and you're trying to sell something, which automatically makes me distrust, mm. right? And so how do I go into a relationship with distrust? I don't, and so now I turn away. So now, even if you put valuable content out to the world, you've already lost us because you started selling to us. And so it's, it's very key to give value, give value, give value. Let people see what's happening. Let them build their trust. Let them build the awareness of the brand, which will in then turn grow the interest in what you're doing, which will make it a lot easier when it's time for you to say, you know what? All right, I've been doing this. I've been doing this. Here's what I also have to offer. You know what I mean? And that's something right. I'm, gonna let, I'm gonna let you finish, John. Um, but somebody said, but how? But everybody's way is different as far as how to build brand. But how we built our brand in two minutes is that we just created as maximum value as possible. So before we had a podcast, we had an Instagram page. Well, even before I had my own personal Instagram mm-hmm. page, I wasn't selling anything. I was just, mm-hmm. I was just, I was just adding value. People that I would take time to write, write captions, write posts, make videos. When we started Earn Your Leisure, the whole we didn't really even know. To be completely honest, we we didn't know how to monetize a podcast. But we figured that once we had enough attention, there would be opportunities to monetize. So our goal was just to add as much value as possible, and that helped build our brand on social media. And then, you know, all throughout, we just had a unique way to relay information with business and mix it with pop culture. And that was our brand building proposition was that we're going to educate people for free. We're going to give as much value as possible. We didn't sell anything. We didn't have merch. Mm. We didn't have a live event. We didn't have anything. Nothing. So now when we have paid products and we've already built brand equity, but it took us 12, 13 months before we even, probably even longer than that, like before we even sold one thing that made us in. <laughs> Yo, and so it reminds me of that, of that graph, that last graph, right? You guys didn't start with sales. You could have, if you, you could have tricked a few people into buying a quick e-course right at the jump without really knowing anything. But instead you were that red line, you were, you, you were building that brand equity by just giving, 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 giving. And as a result, look at the platform that you guys grew. And, you know, speaking of Nike, I, I caught a glimpse of their brand essence framework and their one word was performance. I don't think that you're any faster in Nikes than you are in Adidas, but they, their, their, core brand was performance and think about how just think about the look of their logo the swoosh kind of just makes you feel like performance the flash yeah yeah. you know and 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 it's a really astute observation Rashad that that they don't they don't sell I never thought about that they don't sell shit in their commercials no they don't they don't sell they brands so so for any so if if you have a tea company if you have an e-com company you know, what are ways, what's that word going to be for you, A, and then B, how can you associate your brand with that feeling? For example, at Loop, our purpose is to move people. We don't care about insurance in the same way that Nike only cares about sneakers because it drives performance. So we, we, we stand for movement. Right. Because insurance gets you on the road and then you go and you got to do all the things that you got to do. So how do how are we going to build brand around that? Well, we're going to have photography of people on the road, on their hustle, doing their shit. And just uh, just a little photo, just a little icon at the bottom that says loop. Right. And so, for example, those are just some of the low hanging fruit ways, man, that, that we could um, that we could build brand you got to lock in on that specific value that you feel you want to put brand equity into and 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 i I also think that for building a brand going back to our personal experience you know we learned a lot from rap 
Um, and we took a lot, we took a lot from hip hop artists to help build our brand. So, you know, being a big Wu-Tang fan growing up in the late nineties. And, you know, when you saw that W that meant something, mm -hmm. you didn't have to hear Wu-Tang to see that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like when you saw the W, you are, you automatically associated Wu-Tang. And then when you, when you had the killer bees, like they had a mascot, if you think about it. So it's like, even schools, you can learn a lot from schools. School is not a problem. It's what they're teaching. That's the problem. But the infrastructure of school is actually pretty brilliant. Schools, they have, they have clubs inside of schools. They have sports teams to keep you engaged. They have times when you check in, they have periods, they have lunchtime, they have mascots. Mascots is extremely important. So it's like when you, when you saw the killer bee, that meant something mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm saying? It, but it all equated back to Wu-Tang, but they didn't have to put Wu-Tang on every single thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like, when you see us, our mascots, are our emojis. That's like a mascot, right? Yeah. Like that's like a team mascot. Yes. That's branding. We don't have to put earn your leisure on everything. So now you see EYL. EYL, three letters is very nostalgic when you think of luxury brands. YSL, like you know, it's, there's a lot of stuff when you when you think of like three letters, like it's real easy to remember and it's an it's a, an abbreviation. Mm -hmm. People love abbreviations. Even if they hate the abbreviation, IRS, <laughs> you name it. Like, you know what I'm saying? People, so, DEA. Yeah, yeah. Use, use, use anything other than the IRS. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. The alphabet boys. Yo, we got Ani in here. Let's let Ani in. I would love yeah, yeah, let's bring him um, in. Yeah. So, so, that, so that, that's, something that, that's something to keep in mind as well as far as you don't necessarily, and even assets over liabilities. I was going to go there. Assets over liabilities, yeah. that's ours. We made that up. Anybody that's knocking that off, you should Please be ashamed no. of yourself. But um, once again, we don't have to put earn your leisure on everything because whether you see the emojis, whether you see EYL, whether you see assets over liabilities, it all equates back to the mothership. That's exactly where I was going. And if you look at the most popular thing we sell, it is assets over liabilities, but it goes back to the, the, the point of what we're doing, right? Value, put value in your life, take the things out that don't add value, right? So assets over liabilities. And so when you see that, it doesn't matter where you see it, most people are going to think us. Mm -hmm. they don't have to, it doesn't have to say earn your leisure. When they see assets over liability, even some of those bootleggers out there, they automatically think <laughs> that, that that must be earn your leisure. And shout out to our lawyer who's on that. Uh, cease and desist, please. Yo, you but, guys, <laughs> yo, someone's under your guys' skin, man, because you guys nah, think, you know, right? we, we just got to put it out there. We got to put it out there. You got you to gotta be original, man. It, it's, it's synonymous with us. And so, like, again, you don't have to see earn your leisure on a shirt. You see assets or liabilities. We're thinking, all right, those people must be an earner. I had a friend of mine today who was climbing in the uh, the Catskill Mountains the, over the like over the spring break, and she made it to the top and was wearing the assets over liability shirt. You know what happened when she got up there? Somebody ran up to her and said, "Oh, you're an earner too." Oh, talk about brand, man! Freaked her out, right? Because she was like, "Huh? No, I worked with Troy. We were we like <laughs> he's my coworker." She's like, oh, but you're not an earner. She's like, yeah, I'm an earner, but like, that's my friend. Like I can call him. And it was like, call him. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, let's not do that. <laughs> but it, it's synonymous. You can, one thing leads to the next. And so we, we don't have to put earn your leisure on everything. People know us for assets over liabilities. Mm. We got, wait, we got alumni in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got we alumni. Got alumni. Yo, yeah. what's up, Ani? How you doing, man? How you living? Doing well, man. I'm excited. Shadi and Troy, what's up, y'all? My God, what's, <laughs> what's going on? What's going on, man? Yeah, last time we talked, y'all were regular human beings. And now, <laughs> status, you know, Range Rovers and bus downs. I see what it is. <laughs> it, it, was, it was your fault. Partially your fault. <laughs> yeah. John, let's see your two-tone back on your wrist. Congrats. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, hey, I, I mean, did lose it for a minute. We, we did get the watch and we did get the car. We haven't gotten the driver yet. So we're getting there. We're getting to your level soon. No inspiration. <laughs> yes, yes. Yo, Ani, I'm glad you jumped on, man. You were the first person I thought of when, when, when I thought of brand. I think that you've done an exceptional job. Um, for, those, for those that don't know Ani, man, just total total legend been in the game a long time uh one of the practitioners that i admire most in the space um a lot of people talk it man but but ani's been doing this shit and doing it across industries managing artists have rapped with khalifa at, at some time is now managing the the career of the young star ani khan but in addition dabbles in a little e-commerce we had launched equity apparel together uh uh owner and ceo of kolkata chai co um, dope concept that the audience wants to hear more about, but also dabbles in real estate. So you're a lot like me in the sense that we are multi hyphenate practitioners. And the one, you know, 
the one through line that you have across all your projects is that they all have impeccable brand. I mean, we're not big landlords by any stretch, but you would think we were because, you know, the way that we brand our shit. And for example, in Philly, where I know you have some real estate, you have just regular plots of land, which anyone would have just called a plot of land. But Ani done branded it, done called it, you know, uh, Tiger Park, uh, created a website around it, you know, really made an experience, hosted some pop up art, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and even with your with your uh, chai concept, which I believe is your anchor at the moment, um, you really lead with a super, super brand forward approach, man. So um, welcome to the show. Welcome to the limited series. Guest number one, episode number one. What, um, an, honor. what an honor. Thank you. Y'all. Yes, sir, man. Well, I would love to get your take for some of the audience uh, on the power of brand and how it's been able to effectively elevate and distinguish your concepts from a concept that unbranded. Yeah, I missed the, the end of it, but I think I caught enough to, to respond. I think, you know, I look at brand as the real only way to get competitive advantage when you're playing down a couple cards, right? People like us, first generation entrepreneurs, when you're coming up, we just don't have access to the same things that a lot of people do. And therefore, your own ingenuity is your competitive advantage, right? And I think brand, you know, you touched on it. It's when you, you got to make a big investment in it up front, right? But being tactical and being smart about brand up front allows you to create that moat around your business, right? Nobody can do it like you do it if you do it well. And, and I really learned from, you know, hip hop music and, you know, EYL is, is kind of spot on with my education in terms of like Jay-Z, Rockefeller, right? That diamond went up, you know what time it was. Mm. Master P, no limit, you know, make them say, uh, like it was these, these references to their brand at all times that created that moat around what they did. And to me, I looked at it the same way. Like if I was going to, you know, um, build a company or launch something from zero, when I have a lot of, you know, much better capitalized players around me, what's my advantage? It's storytelling, it's branding, and it's creating that, you know, that bridge. And I think, you know, I tend to look at brand like it gives your uh, company personality. And it also, most importantly, allows people to buy in with an emotion. And that's the toughest thing. You know, you're talking about sales versus brand. When you have a brand that people can emotionally relate to, that is the most definitive thing about where, you know, about your company going forward, because people can't take that from you, right? Your sales might get cratered because of COVID, or you might have, you know, a, a supply chain issue, whatever it is. But if your brand represents all of your values and has that personality, people will always stick by you. And, and I think I'm a very long-term player, similar to y'all. And, uh, and that's how I would break it down. Yo, so talk about, talk about, <clears throat> Talk about like your, your chai concept, right? There's a lot of tea shops out there, but I have never seen any of them with a line around two blocks with like straight up, you know, all the Indian boys out there lining up. They can't wait to support. <laughs> you had, you had eater.com over there. You, I mean, you guys unlocked ridiculous distribution. You guys have, fanatics you guys created like the uh like what, what do you guys call it like that the pour over challenge like you guys have done so much shit and it's like a, a 200 square foot space but it is like really a, a crate it's crazy what you've been able to do with that space man so talk about like how you approach that and what gave you the what what's the secret sauce man like how can someone who has pretty little by term in terms of space and in terms of resources, be able to maximize the way you have. Right. I mean, you know, just for, for context, we opened six months before COVID shut New York city down and we ended up 2020, we ended up in the black with both our restaurant and our e-commerce operations. And uh, I attribute a lot of that to brand. And that's why I say it is because, you know, I mean, to, to answer your question about how we unlocked it, I think we approached it as, and I talk a lot about this, you know, storytelling. What is a story that you're telling as a company, right? That becomes part of your brand story, which thereby leads to brand equity, right? And you guys touched on this a lot. What's brand equity? Simply put, is credibility, right? It is the intangible uh, reputation that you have with your 
customers that nobody could take from you. So when we uh, spent about 18 months before launching the cafe, doing pop-ups, doing events, food festivals, you know, hustling around the city, that was to create brand equity, right? Because we knew, look, whether we had a, a thousand square foot space or 200 square foot space, they couldn't take that brand equity from us. And, you know, John, you and I have talked about this a lot. Is like, how do you scale the one-to-one -one interaction, right? That's what we did to build up that brand equity. What I mean by that is responding to every DM, going above and beyond, you know, at, at events or online to give people, you know, an extra cup on the house or, you know, FaceTime with their mom because they were excited to walk into a chai shop, whatever it was, we made ourselves really available to that, built up that brand equity and then monetize that, right? And I think that's where a lot of creators struggle with, right? They, some of these YouTubers have, you know, decent brand equity. You got a lot of social media personalities with decent brand equity, but if you don't have a product to sell back to them, you're just popular, right? And, and <laughs> don't pay the bills as, as we know. So we, you know, we turned that brand equity into, into that experience, leaned into our community, stepped up for them, right? What I mean by that is we were hosting, you know, artists meet and greets at the cafe. We were letting, um, you know, people meet with their book club and things like that. We were pouring back into the community because that's what our brand represented. And now, you know, we did, you know, well into the six figures of e-commerce in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic, which really opened up what this business can look like, right? So now we have a true omni-channel model um, with, with the retail, with e-commerce. I'm actually going to be in Austin in a couple of weeks, John. We just locked in with neighborhood goods out there. Hit me up. So, you know, we're taking it now to retail as well. And, you know, it's that line from uh, American Gangster, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, what is it? Uh, General Mills, right? It, it, mm. when, when, when Frank Lucas is making that, that uh, comparison, Blue Magic, right? That's, that's a brand name. They uh -huh. don't know me more than they know the CEO of General Mills, but they know what that stands for. Mm. And that, you know, that's, that's a hustler's anthem right there. So I think a lot mm. of that is, uh, is, is what I've picked up and, and what I put down. Uh, can, you, can you talk about, like, I feel like branding, um, storytelling is extremely important and the power of creating myths. And shout out to my brother Wallow. Um, he had one of the most profound things I've ever heard. Uh, if anybody doesn't know his story, he spent 20 years in jail. He came out, hit the start. He has one of the top podcasts in the world. But long story short, he said something that was extremely profound to me. He was like, you don't, you don't have to never beef with the information. You don't have to like somebody to learn from them. And I say that to say, um, Donald Trump, regardless of how you feel about him, it's not a political show. But one of the greatest things he's ever did was brand himself. And he made things that was normal seem out of this world extraordinary. Normal in his world, as far as a lot of people in Manhattan have buildings. That's not really normal, but I'm just saying as far as be a millionaire, billionaire in Manhattan, you know, a lot of people have buildings. And he didn't even own those, a lot of these buildings, but he made sure he put his name on every single building. So now when you drive down the West Side Highway and you see 10 buildings that say Trump on it, whether he owns it or not is irrelevant because the story and the myth lives much larger than his you know, royalty fee for actually leasing his name out, right? Yeah. So to bring it down on a micro level, you know, I talk about this a lot, but you know, people see our trucks. We have a truck, an 18 wheeler. We're not the only person in the world that has trucks. A lot of people have 18 wheel trucks, but the story and the myth was told and it, it's gonna live way longer <laughs> and it became a million times bigger than the truck because we put our emojis on it. We put EYL University on it. We put Earn Your Leisure on it. We made a complete <laughs> monstrosity of it. And whatever, the, whatever we get from the truck, the value in brand equity and the value of doing that is gonna live way further yeah. than just traveling goods from Atlanta to Houston. And what, what it also does is it, it stamps us in that world, right? People watched us have an interview about it. Mm -hmm. They watched us learn about it. And they watched us actually execute on the information that we obtained. Mm. So now it's all, it's, it's a funny question. Everybody asks how we're doing, how we're doing. And like, yo, y'all got a truck. What the hell? What? Because nobody had ever seen that done. Even though like, I mean, we're from New York. So we see 18 wheelers all the time. Never did we ever think that that's actually money that's passing us. That's mm -hmm. actually a business that's passing us. And so now to see us do it being from where we're from, it's like, oh my gosh, and, and, and you, guys, it, you guys are bold enough to get a truck. And like John said, you're crazy enough to put your face on it. Even, I want to get Ani's perspective, but even I want to even break it even lower than that. Cause some people might, you know, a truck is still cost a good chunk of change. 
merch. Everybody does merch. A lot of every small business does merch. So we're not the first people to have merch, assets over liabilities, track suits, things of that nature. But we took a lot of L's in our merch journey. We're still learning merch. And we revamped our merch. We found a, a distributor in Pakistan. It's a whole process. <laughs> so we could have just we could have just put online that we're selling merch. But going through that process, we gained information. So we filmed a podcast about how to start a merch company. And we did every single thing that we do from A to Z free. We could have charged a lot of money for that. Mm -hmm. We did that free. We put it out. And then we said, okay, here's the discount to buy the merch. <laughs> mm. we, we created a story and we added value. And then we're going to sell the product. Yeah. And we're not going to apologize about selling the product. But we made a story about no, it. No, but a lot, a lot of the things that you guys are saying um, is illustrated on that last graph. Things that build brand, you will take an L4 up front. Mm -hmm. The truck is not making you money. If it's making you money at all, it might even be costing you money. It costs me a lot of fucking money. All the things that I've done that have enriched my brand, Co-Friend Harlem, for example, is incubator that first put me on the map, cost me a ton of cash. Ani, you have kicked off a number of projects, and I know you front-loaded the investment <laughs> up front, right? Oh. And we are delusional practitioners in that we heavily over-index on brand. What's that, you know? There's probably a balance between going too brand heavy, uh, you know, and compromising sales. But I, I just I feel like I see you execute on your projects. And when I see you storytell to Rashad's point, yeah, um, I know what it is that you're doing. Um, so for you, I mean, is the hope that the brand like are you just going all in and you feel like you're going to cash in on some big opportunities down the stretch? And for you, it's just about kind of going the distance um, or, you know, or is it a, is it just the only way you know how, like help me make sense of yeah. this ridiculous thing that is like going all in on brand up front. Yeah, that, that's a really great point. And, and to Rashad's point too. And, and this is, I think one of the most tactical tips that I want to share with people watching tonight is like, you know, Rashad mentioned the word myth, right? And sometimes when you're starting out early on that story that you're telling, you may not entirely be living or you know you're trying to make it look a certain type of way or you know you don't really know if it, you're going to make it to the other side of that right Jonathan you and I've been in many scenarios where you know we're in the middle of something whether it's a, a residential you know development project or, or or something crazy and we don't know what the outcome is going to be but that documentation and that storytelling and you reflecting on your experience throughout that whole process mm. is to me all an extension of brand and, and I want to mention something that happened in my life that changed. It, it didn't change anything, actually. It just validated what I already knew. And that was, I was in the middle of a couple of my first real estate projects, right? And so what I would do is I would work, you know, five days a week on the agency job. And then every weekend I'd work real estate. So I wake up at 9 a.m., go to Newark, New Jersey, I'm painting, you know, spackling, doing all these small things, trying to get my, my units turned around. And I used to document all of it. It wasn't glamorous. It was literally just me eating shit the entire time, but talking about what was going on, talking about the value, the neighborhood, the ARV, you know, the construction budgets. And in eight months, I had raised a quarter million dollars just from people on Instagram who I didn't know, watching my stories and being like, yo, I trust you. I like what you're doing. I want to get into real estate. What's your minimum? And me being like, it's 50 grand to invest with me on a joint venture. And walking out of that with $250,000 from Instagram stories. Right? <laughs> Just because my brand was constantly being extended through, you know, stories or through my posts or whatever storytelling I was in the middle of. And that to me was so real because that validated this thing that I knew that I think nowadays we focus on micro interactions with people that we look up to or respect or want to learn from. And those micro interactions actually have much bigger impact than we realize. It mm. may be a 15 second clip, but it sits with people if, you're, if your brand story is whole. Mm. And uh, man, I, I took that 250 and I created you know, millions of dollars in portfolio value without having to put up my own bread, that's right? Incredible. So for anybody that's like 
wary about where they are with brand or if they're like, you know, they got 200 followers, it doesn't matter, right? What matters is you telling that story and or that myth at certain times and mm. being consistent with it until the right people pick up on it and be like, this is dope, let me share this. And that's how you grow. And that's how you honestly remain who you are. No, nothing yeah. changes about you or your story. You just consistently tell it. Ani, I got a question in, in that because it's, it's like, again, it's that hip hop coming into our lives, right? Like when Drake said, I'm the greatest, I said that before I knew I was. It's that mm. same thing. But I wonder in this sense, like we see people start businesses and they try to start brands and then they don't even trust themselves because something deviated in the story. So for me, I'm thinking about your situation and how COVID was an alter, right? You Six months after you start this business and we actually recorded the podcast, this unimaginable event happens in your business, but you still trust the brand. So can you talk about that, how you didn't deviate from what you, that story that you created and try to create a new one? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I think that, first of all, sometimes your brand story might change a little bit and having the flexibility and knowing what can change and what can't change, that's like an intuition you got to have as you know a founder, as a creator, and you'll build that up over time, right? That's like a muscle that you build over time. Um, for, for us, you know, my, my, my guy right now is taking a video of all this. That day that the cafe shut down, we pulled up with cameras and we documented in real time you know, it raining on the, on the window, me standing outside being like, yo, this is insane. And in real time sharing how I felt, you know, because that was still central to who we were as founders in that brand, right? Mm -hmm. We still believed in the business, believed in the community, believed in our product. We just got hit with the act of God, right? But that didn't mean that I wasn't allowed to be vulnerable. And I think that's the, the other key here, right? It's like people look at, you know, even with John now, like John's the face of Loop, but John's brand is different from the Loop brand, mm -hmm. right? And so like there may be certain vulnerabilities that he has to share as a founder that won't be reflected on the company, but, you know, they'll be reflected in his journey. And that's the perspective I took. I was like, look, I'm, I'm the founder, I'm the owner, and I'm taking these L's yeah. and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take them and I'm going to share them. But the company is still going to be all things go, sticking to the story but we're going to show the, the reality of it in different ways. This is, I want, I wanted to say something yeah, before yeah, we right. go on a different topic. We interviewed Grant Cardone and he, um, he actually. Shout out uncle G <laughs> yeah, 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 episode out now. Classic. So <laughs> one twenty eight, right. We, we was telling him about the trucks and he said, he said, um, he was like, you know what you, you know, it'd be really good marketing. I'm like, what? He was like, burn it. He's like, burn the truck. <laughs> and so he was saying how uh, one of his it's so his, grand man it's ridiculous his truck burnt he had a truck and it burnt and they called him like yo the truck is on fire and he was like tape it that's good content <laughs> but so and shout out to Maddie J this is this is one of the most profound things I've ever heard in life Maddie J on Ash Cash's podcast Inside the Vault EYO Network slight plug um, <laughs> so he, Maddie J said he was on Toro. He took a major L. His cars was getting like messed up. He had to go to mechanic. He was losing money. While he was losing money, while he was making all of these mistakes, he was documenting his journey. Because he said, one day people will pay you for your failure. Mm. That means is that everything that you went through is now going to be a learning experience. Now Somebody you can else. teach. Yep. So now you went through a global pandemic and lost money and did this and did that. Now you are in a unique position as somebody that actually made it out of that as the voice of authority. Mm -hmm. Now people will pay you for mentorship, yeah. for courses, for classes, for books, whatever. Yeah. So it's like, even in a loss, there's a blessing because by documenting that and by not running from it, by yeah. embracing it, it puts you in a position yeah. as being an authority that people have to come to you because yeah. the next time there's a global pandemic, You've been the only things. way that they can learn is from somebody that's already been through it. Yeah, and, it, and, that, and that's the thing, like they've watched you go through something, right? They've watched you in the mud and it's like, I was with him. I remember when he was crying. <laughs> I'm so happy for him. I wanna, I wanna support him in any way I can. John, mm -hmm. I got a question for you as Ani was talking I was thinking to myself, right? You have a trusted brand as yourself as John Henry. What is that like now going the loop? Or do you feel like you have to reinvent yourself and or, or the your audience that was with you that knows you as John Henry? Is it are you thinking they automatically gonna come with you now the loop? And what's that process like? Man, it's a learning experience for sure. My brain is gritty as fuck. 
right? Like, <laughs> like, like Ani, Ani, when he came on, he said, John, I see you got the two tone back. I got the two tone back. All right. <laughs> but here's, the th- here's the thing. Day, day. Here's the thing. This is, yeah, no, 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 sir. Just the day, just, day, just. Day, just, day, just. <laughs> um, I had to pawn this bad boy. Hmm. This bad boy right here, I had to pawn it when I was in my lowest point of these renovations, went south, I'm out of pocket, you know, um, and, and I had to come up with the mortgage and I was tiz at, I was tapped. And I was looking around like, yo, what, what could I just like, what could I sell for three G's? And, uh, you know, and I did one of these, I was like, oh, fuck. And, you know, and I, <laughs> I knew what I had to do. And I pulled up to the Diamond District, shout out my boy, Gabriel. And, uh, and, and yeah, he, he gave me, he slipped, he slipped me three G's for it and I, and I, and I bought it back. And then that happened one more time before the end of the deal. And so now it's a badge of honor, but for example, that's my brand. I'm just a gritty motherfucker. I don't, I don't mind it. Um, but the loot brand is an insurance company. It's a financial services entity. And so this for me has been an exercise of phase one is me leveraging my personal brand, much like you much like you do to prop up these new entities but at a certain point you got to step back and let this new entity grow because if you lean on your own brand too heavily for too long then you will never be able to outgrow the current size of your brand and i know that loop will be a multi-billion dollar company we will take it public and it can never get there if it's the jh show it has to end up being something that's larger than any one person. And in order for that to happen, I have to take a step back. And so it's still something that we're learning to do and we're proactively thinking through because at the same time, you want to think about, you want to use all the things that you have at your disposal. Because if you are Bobby Bernstein and you got a rich uncle who put up bread to get your business going, and by the way, let's say he's got a portfolio of buildings and he can put you on and whatever, you're going to take advantage of that. And so we as a culture have very little things that we can that we can take advantage of. So the few tools that we have, we definitely should deploy. Um, that's my take. So, whoo, man, um, Ani, I want to give you the last word here. We're coming up. Can we, can, can we just can we can we do like a bonus round? Let's do a bonus round. All right. Well, let's. I just got one more question. Then, and can we get like two questions from the from the? Uh, yeah, Ernest, from the I audience. Got, I got questions. Right, so, I'll raise and, your hand. I, I just got one question before we go to um, question and answer. Scarcity. How do you feel about the scarcity model as far as branding? Because mm. like Cronuts, that's a shop in uh in New York that they sell Cronuts, which is like a combination of donuts and croissants. They only you they only open for like an hour a day at like eight o'clock in the morning. This is before COVID. I don't know what happened, but you gotta and I actually did this before. Um, you gotta like wait in line at like six o'clock in the morning. They open up, but just like it's a scarcity model. There's a variety of different um people that even sneakers. Jordans, they release the sneakers. They only have a certain amount. They could make, Nike can make as many sneakers as they want, yep. but they know that if they have a, a, a limited amount, it drives the demand. It's a whole scarcity play. So how do you feel about scarcity model in building brand and marketing? Yeah, I mean, so personally, I think that as a society or just, that there's so much going on right now that if you can afford to lean on scarcity as a, as a, um, a point of attraction, use it sparingly. But I think that nowadays, like if you're in the middle of a gold rush and you're like being romantic or being cute about how much you're putting out, um, I think that could actually be a disservice for a lot of brands. So I'm, I'm aware of the power of scarcity. We, you know, we went through it ourselves last, you know, during COVID we had a brunch at the restaurant that was like only had 10 seats a day and we would sell out in like 15 minutes every day, you know, and it was a, a great way to like build awareness around what was happening and keeping us top of mind. So it does work a hundred percent. But I think what a lot of people do is they lean on scarcity when they don't really have something that actually validates their brand, if that makes sense. Right. And, you know, if you're starting something new and it's like, Oh, only 50 pairs, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? like okay. so I think, I think scarcity is a, is a tool that you can deploy with, with finesse when you're at that point, but don't lean on that to, to start something because it's kind of see-through. Yeah, there's other ways to deploy scarcity too, though, right? It's not just quantity, it's also time sensitivity. Time, yeah, yeah, time, yeah. Um, right, so you can make it for a limited time. And for example, when I'm out there raising money, 
one thing I realize is if you don't give them a re like if you don't if there's no time that the round is gonna end, people will kick the tires forever until there's an action forcing event. Um, so I I would agree with with you, Ani. Uh, but also some of these classic retailers that you know ironically have gone out of business. They've done they do things really well, certain things really well, and that was the offers, right? So like it ended up it can be something that cheapens your brand, but these, man, these, these cats are good at straight off like JC pennies with the ill offers. Now, not every brand is going to be a coupon brand. However, I pay attention to, you know, offers that drive a lot of value and Ani, you're in the econ business and EYL, you know, you guys run these flash sales too. So I think scarcity, I agree with you, Ani. I like your take that scarcity is a tool and you to learn to use it. And I think that scarcity in the fashion business specifically works very differently probably than any other industry from what I've seen. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right, let's, take, get, let's, get one, let's get one question from let's the- Let's see, we got a hand over here. If, they, if they're actually there. Let's we'll, see. We'll see. Hodges, what's going on? Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. What's going on? They had a hand up the whole time, so. Yeah. Oh, good yeah, morning, fam. What's, um, what's going on? on? Good brothers, you, you just answered my question, Ani did, because uh, I have a couple real estate uh, properties and it was hard for me to find um, people to do good work. They was always, like in my opinion, half-assed, you know, they told me they knew how to do something. And after the job was done, it was, you know, it was whack. So I ended up having to get the knowledge myself and do the <laughs> job on my own. So uh, he, he answered it for me. That's why I had my hand up. And I appreciate you calling on me. And brothers, have a nice day. Nah, no problem. Appreciate you. Blessings. Blessings. Blessings he on kept it a buck. Blessings. Just, Blessings. Um, yeah. Also, also to, to the folks watching right now, because I'm seeing some questions around uh, that, that PDF. So if you go to loopinsure.co slash EYL, loopinsure.co slash EYL, that PDF is now available. So you could just click on it and you just type in your email and then you'll get a PDF sent to your inbox. So you can get all of that, um, all of that brand assist framework and all that other jazz sent, sent to you and just use it in your hustle, man. And let me know, let me know what you think of it. Um, yo, while we get another audience question, can we just do a, a quick lightning round? Hip hop, we all refer to it. We all pull from it. Mm -hmm. Let's go through and, and name who we think has been the most effective brander in all of hip hop and some key lessons that we've taken away personally. Um, who wants to start? Yeah, I mean, there's been so many great branders um, from Death Row Records to No Limit Records to Cash Money Records to Bad Boy. Bad Boy yeah. But I think the greatest brander has to be Jay because, you know, he's he's his brand has survived <laughs> three decades and that's extremely impressive. And the biggest takeaway that I get from Jay is that he always reinvents himself and he always, Drake does this well too. He always surrounds himself with the newest people. He has no problem severing ties, whether that's a good thing or not, that's to be <laughs> fair. Jay always, you know, he's always in the mix with, with, with something that's new and progressive. He's not afraid to change with the times. Mm -hmm. And he's built his brand off of a mystique. It's a nostalgia. Mm -hmm. You never see him. He's mm -hmm. not on Instagram. He's never on Twitter. He's not on TikTok. And that's a way to, you know, that, that's, that's risky. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you know, and it, it, that's extremely, extremely risky and extremely, extremely rare. But... He's built such a nostalgic brand um, that at any given moment when you see him, it's like seeing a ghost. Like, you know what I mean? If it wasn't for these pictures, they wouldn't see me at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think he does that intentionally. And um, that has helped him um, remain relevant for 30 years. Yeah. I, I, I mean, obviously, Jay is our guy. Jay is our favorite guy. We're going to keep saying Jay's name. And I know, John, you're sharing this. Until we sit next to him, but um, I'll say Yeezy. Yeezy. I, I think I think what Ye's done um, is incredible, right? Like the Yeezy name, the the brand itself speaks for itself. It's transcended music. It's trans. It's it's transcended fashion. It is the symbol of new and cutting edge, 
And he's done that over time. And he said he was going to do it, right? Like he lives that line too. I'm the greatest. Before, I, I said that before I knew I was. Mm. He's been saying it since 03. He would say it to anybody that would listen. Um, so to watch it come to fruition. And even like with the Forbes thing, I know, John, you have some, some things to say. And I, I was right on with you as far as the Forbes thing. It, it doesn't matter if he's worth 6 billion or 2 billion. He's a billionaire. And he said he would be. And he's here mm. doing it now. So his branding is amazing um, it, with everything he does. And everybody might not agree with the way he goes about it, but you can't deny if he steps into a room or if he puts his name on a product, it's out of here, right? Mm. People are wondering, hey, look at Gap. Wow, why is Gap stock rising? Well, yeah, this guy said he's doing a brand partnership with them. And they know when he puts stuff in the stores, it's leaving the stores. Mm -hmm. I've been, if anyone has been to a, a, a Kanye concert, I've been to a bunch of them. There are people who literally don't come to see the music. They will stand in line for the merch for the entire show. Wow. For the entire show. <laughs> I, no joke. I went to the St. Pablo tour. And it was the one he was like floating over the, 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 mm -hmm, the whole mm -hmm. crowd. And I tried to buy a shirt and I couldn't get, I was like, I'm, I'm going to miss the show if I wait in this line. And people were waiting in line. My wife was like, I'll go. You, I'll miss a song or two. I'm like, nah, it's fine. At the end of the show, I had to wait an hour to get a t-shirt. I'm like, these people have not left. Everything he puts on sale at a concert sells out. But also, before you go, John, he's also like Jay in a sense where you don't see him. He's mm -hmm. also built a nostalgia. Mm -hmm. He pops up. He's more active than Jay on Twitter, but he pops up for Twitter rants every now and then. And then he's like the groundhog. Then he goes under. He'll be on Instagram yeah. then delete all his Instagram. Then he's driving in water. Yeah, it's that it's that <laughs> Elon Musk, that crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like he's he, he's another one where he's not mm. really as accessible like that. Mm. Yeah, I think we, that's something we said, like one of their best attributes is that you can't access it, have access to Mysterious, them. man. Yeah. Jay Electronica said um, familiarity doesn't breed. Um, oh, well, that's it, the line. Ju just content, like yeah, just yeah, content. Yeah. Like meaning, meaning like sometimes you oversaturate yourself. It doesn't even breed. People get, they start to hate you just because they see you so much. Mm -hmm. It's like, like <laughs> it's like being with a, you know, a, what? a, a, a spouse or what, somebody what do you like. Say? What do you say? One day they want to knight you, the next good night you. Yeah. Mm. Ani, what you think, man? Who's who's the best brand in the hip hop game? I mean, I think, yeah, I think the answer is Jay because of the ecosystem of product and brands and businesses that he's created, right? I mean, what he did with Tidal, um, Champagne, um, Rock Aware, you know, Jay's pedigree and his track record are insane. I'm going to throw in a, a dark horse just to acknowledge what, what Nipsey did while he was here, you know, mm. rest in peace, but I think Nip was instrumental in branding a consciousness and a way of thought that we hadn't really seen in a long time, right? He, he made people believe in ownership and, and, and got people interested in real estate and, you know, was doing a bunch of technology, smartphone, AR, you know, NFT related things way before, you know, any of these things were in mainstream consciousness. And I think that you know, nips, all money in, no money out, you know, that there was a lot, there was a lot there, you know, fuck the middleman. Like there was a lot there. He just was more marathon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, thank you. Mm -hmm. Reminded me right like that. It, it didn't, it wasn't mainstream. So less people will acknowledge it, but for, for people like us who were grinding during the time that Nip was grinding, it was like, you know, he had a different effect on consciousness. And I think that's been, you know, obviously it's big for me. People know how I feel about Nip, but yep. I got to acknowledge that because I think that he was one of the new school players, you know, that that was really about to run it up after that first crop of Jay, Ye, 50, Snoop, Dre, you know, like that that graduating class had already moved on. I think, mm. I think Nip was a revolutionary in that sense. Yo, can I also just say that what, what Jay-Z did with title should be fucking illegal. Like that's my man's and he made his bag. But like, had, did no one like, guys, re remember when we came out with title, he made his fucking entire catalog exclusive to title, brought a bunch of artists, got him exclusive to title, inflated the value, sold a third of it to Sprint, cashed in, I think it was 200 mil, right? <laughs> and then once that shit was flopping, uh, <laughs> he pretty much brought his catalog, uh, bought his, his catalog right back on Spotify. And, Apple. Um, and so because he was vulnerable during that time that he was only on title uh, and then he made himself accessible again and sold that bitch and he sold it to Jack Dorsey and then finished cashing out on it. That is ridiculous. That's that's like market manipulation, except for 
it's his own personal catalog and IP, you know, so he could do it. But um, he took the risk, right? I mean, what him and you know Beyonce did with having their music exclusive on a platform that wasn't available to everybody, that when they knew they were losing millions of dollars on the other side, <laughs> that you know, they, it was it was a risky move and it paid off for him. So bought yeah. it for 50, sold a third for 200, finished selling it. Man, it's crazy. I think, yo, I think the best brand in the in the game is Puff. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just, I think that, bro, I, I, I seen recently the ready to die documentary. I mean, the yeah. guy has an eye for talent and when he back big, you know, he put this whole like, like movement and brand around. And for as long as I can remember, Puff has been that flashy type. And he took that whole persona going back to that, you know, to the earliest part of, of this episode, um, his word really like is, is, is just lifestyle in a way that Hove is not. Hove is mysterious. Hove is kind of crusty, actually. Puff, <laughs> you you just you won't find, you know, with the exception of when when his um when his girl passed away, and of course he was in that in that dark period of just mourning. That was the only glimpse of time really that I could think of that Puff wasn't smiling, laughing, and he was able to productize that entire just persona. He's got the spirits brand and I, I had the chance to kick it with his CFO and his CFO told me projects that we invest in don't net a whole lot. The projects that we build from scratch and vertically integrate and that we own the IRR, the internal rate of return, the profit is through the roof because Puff is not that that speaks to his superpower. He's not one to invest in another vehicle and then let it do its thing. He's one to just live it. He lives his products, man. Um, and, and for that, I think Puff is the best brander in the game. Um, That's a good point, John. Because when you were talking about brand, I was thinking about Ciroc. It's more than a drink. It's a lifestyle. A finer mm -hmm. vodka. A much finer vodka. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but this guy had like every commercial was a James Bond movie. Right. Mm. You, and then it became the Ocean's Eleven movie. And it was like, wait, this this. I have to taste this. I, this is the only thing I can drink. I, I need to feel like that. I want to look like that. I need to have that lifestyle. Does this drink bring it? And now you got Khaled and he's on a jet ski. And every time like, I look at his glass and I'm like, that sun, that new uh, summer breeze, like that new drink looks incredible. I have to try mm. it. It's like, it becomes a part of your lifestyle. It, it's great marketing. I just want to say one more thing before we can maybe just get to one more question before we wrap, yeah, but yeah. Um, bringing it back, like X said, get well soon, X. Let's bring it back to the streets. And um, wow, yo, I'm gonna break. I want to always make this as relatable for people as possible. Another EYL alumni that we had, Nacho Benga. He's a he's a young man out of Baltimore. Killer. Crazy story. Grew up in the streets, literally in East Baltimore, and uh, you know became six figure entrepreneur off of nachos. So yeah, he, he does these nachos where he puts like, you know, um, that's what's he, up. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so a long story short, so this is the most practical thing in the world, right? Like. Anybody can make nachos with shrimp. And he was making it in his microwave at first before he learned how to cook. So this is like, cause people be like, you know, this is high level. This is the most practical thing in the world. Branding, right? He built, he told the story through a bunch of other stuff. So he created a dance called the Nacho Benga dance. Nacho Benga. And he went Nacho viral Benga. in Baltimore and colleges like Morgan State and, you know, Townsend and all of these schools and all of the high schools and in the neighborhood. So now, He's going, this is before TikTok. He's going viral for his dance. He made a dance attached to the food. So it's one thing to make the nachos, but now he's branding it with the dance. And, you know, he's doing like going to parties and, and hosting clubs and all of that. So it's so many different yeah. stories that come to mind as far as branding is concerned. But that's one of my favorite because there's nothing more practical than that. Like yeah. he literally started from the bottom. Yeah. Legit. Making nachos. Out the bando, literally. <laughs> if you haven't watched that episode, it's very inspirational. You, you know what's dope too? You fin I'm not gonna finish it, I'll say something. And he, he, without even knowing what he was doing, he's branding himself by creating a story and making himself a legend and a myth. Yeah. But it comes down to nachos. That's the most practical thing in the world. Like he's not selling anything that's out of this world. He's literally selling nachos that you get from nachos, like the bag. <laughs> The nacho bag. Cheese and anything you want. Th this is the craziest part about that story, right? So he's getting booked to come to clubs and be the host, right? He's getting, <laughs> he's getting paid that because his song is crazy. The dance is even crazy. You got the club doing it. You know what he's doing when people are leaving the club? 
selling nachos. He's got his food truck outside selling you the food. Because the first thing you got to do is eat when you come out of a party. Mm -hmm. You've been sweating. You've been drinking. You're hungry. Here goes the nachos. Five dollars. Get your sauce. Wow. Incredible. So, Ridiculous. That's fine. That's fine. I think that's that's a valuable lesson too on brand, right? Is a lot of times like it doesn't the way that your product gets popping or the way you get popping isn't necessarily your core competency, right? The dance might be bigger and getting more impressions than a picture of the nachos, but that's what good thinkers and founders do is they find ways to create, you know, parallel ideas and, and concepts that lift up their entire brand. Let's take one question before we wrap. Yes, yes sir. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. I hope I did Nacho Plow by, by saying sauce there. Okay. Shout out to Nacho. That's my, that's my <laughs> Martelli, boy, we coming to you. Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. What's going on? Oh, wait, wait. Bro. Oh, yeah. I'm here, bro. I'm here, bro. Come on. You know, <laughs> you know what was coming like, next, right? <laughs> yeah, go on, like, you don't don't know, do bridge bro. breaks. Nah, nah, what's going no on, bro? Way, no way. Bless, bless. How y'all fellas doing, man? We great, what's man. Up, man? Good. Glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. Listen, it's funny. You guys have touched on a couple of things that I realized marketing wise that I never noticed before. Like even for example, me signing up with EYL, the day that I was just listening to one of your on uh, Market Mondays and you guys created that urgency with the 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 sale is about to run out. And I was like, damn, shit, 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 shit. next thing I know, bam, I throw my card on the thing. Next thing I know, I'm I'm blessed to be to become an earner. So I'm saying, but you guys drove it into me by creating that urgency, which is crazy. Which is absolutely crazy. Marketing how that works. Uh, Quick thing I wanted to touch on is uh, when you're going back to what you were mentioning as far as with creating a brand. So I'm doing the Amazon, um, the Amazon thing, trying to you know create my brand, and that oh, is so hard sell, to get sell, done. Selling on Amazon, exactly. It's so hard to do right now because you have so much competition, and you have mm. to get a mm. bunch of people. You have to get up front. You have to get uh, rated. You have to get ranked, and all that. So it's so hard. What can you? Is there anything that you might think that I could be able to use to Help me, help me, you know, get better with my business. Wow, that's a great question for Ani, but it's also a brilliant question in general. How do you brand yourself when what you're selling is commoditized and also, i.e., widely available, and also you're on a platform that is commoditized? Um, man, Ani, what's your take on that? That's a powerful question, actually, because a lot of people could probably relate to that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the idea of when you engage with Amazon, you have to know that you are engaging on somebody else's platform and somebody else's brand equity, right? Mm -hmm. Amazon's making it easy for you to sell and easy for other people to transact. And so you're going to lose a little bit of competitive advantage there. My, my recommendation would be create content in your own world and still direct people to Amazon, but that brand equity and the things that you're doing on social, editorial, um, you know, live stream, all those things can still be as fruitful as you need them to be. So just because the transaction is happening on Amazon, it doesn't mean that the entire narrative or the story mm. or the brand is happening on Amazon. You know, so, another, mm. another thing, another thing, this is my take on it. This is what I would do. So the good thing with Amazon is private label. So like lint rollers, shout out to Josh Chris, lint rollers or um, toenail clippers. A lot of these things, this is what a lot of people sell on Amazon because Nobody ever asked where's a lint roller coming from. So like they sell lint rollers in a factory in China, you get it and you can put your label on it. So it could be like EYL lint rollers, right? What I would do is whatever product you're selling, let's say we're selling lint rollers, right? I would now, I would go to every social media blog, whatever. Now going back to creating a story, black owned lint rolling company, the first ever black owned lint rolling company out of Philadelphia, whatever. I would create a story about it mm -hmm. and make the myth and make the story way bigger then would it actually, you're not lying. You're a black owned lint rolling company. But now that sounds way better than me just putting a lint roll on Amazon. Lint rolls for sale. I'm gonna make a whole movie out <laughs> yeah, of it. Exactly. I'm gonna make a whole motion picture out of it. Yeah. Black owned lint rolling company. I started from the bottom, da 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 Had to get distribution from China. It's all about how you say things. <laughs> it's Damn, true. bro. It's, it's true. true. Damn, it's crazy. That's crazy. So, seems, like me, seems to me like I'm gonna have to cut you a check. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's, a, that's a million dollars worth of game, but you know, we we'll talk about that later on. <laughs> Shout out to the earnest. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so separately. Yes. <laughs> Gentlemen, this 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 was fun. This was fun, guys. Um, John, I'll let you I'll let you put this wrap this up. Episode one, man, in the books. Thank you guys for rocking and rolling with us, man. Um, Ani, always a pleasure to have you on. You guys gotta check out Ani, man. Uh he's at I, 
at Ani Hustles on Instagram, on every other platform. Just one of the realest practitioners in the game. Um, you get a lot of knowledge just following all of his content. So talk about storytelling, talk about brand. I take notes from him. I personally reach out to him with questions that I have around how to crack the code on marketing, on brands and things of that nature. So definitely tap in with Ani, man. That's the dude. Support his, his uh, chai concept. You won't be disappointed. Um, it's, a, it's a lot more than chai. So lock in with Ani. Uh, but yeah, to, to all the folks uh, listening, man, thank you guys. This has been a limited, uh, uh, this is episode one of a limited series. We're just getting going. We're just testing out and experimenting with the show format. Um, I know that some of you guys, uh, I, I can already see um, hundreds and hundreds, literally, of downloads of the framework. So I hope that you guys take value from it. Um, I think in future episodes, we will keep the presentations to a minimum and just keep it more rooted in conversation, experimentation, and you know, examples from pop culture and different moments of that nature. Next up on episode two, we're going to be diving into content strategy which everyone here on this particular pod could literally do a master session on. And our special guest for that episode is going to be none other than the team captain for Gary V. So this is uh, Andy Cranack who had, who, he runs Gary V's entire 35 person content team and just crushes their content strategy. So we're going to get into the three H's of, of content hub, hero hygiene, how you can make, hire how much they should cost how you should structure your whole shit it's going to be a banger so thank you guys um eyl appreciate you all as as always and um for those of you guys listen remember loopinsure.co the link is linked up there tap in um and join the wait list slash make sure you download the framework talk about scarcity it's going away at the end of the day so you got to go <laughs> download that shit today uh, and then we'll take it from there fellas thank you guys so much appreciate y'all oh, love all is love right. thank you thank y'all love y'all Peace. The link the link is also in the description of this video and is pinned here. So um yeah, thank you guys. This was fun. See you next week. Later. Peace.